Right, I'm, I'm, here today to talk, I'm here today to talk a little bit about QGIS and how it can be used for what I call ex exploratory data analysis and visualization. Um, just a two second introduction to QGIS if you don't know what that is. QGIS is a, an open source uh, GIS, desktop GIS package. So basically you can think of you know, the, the commercial ones, MapInfo, uh, ArcMap, and QGIS is like an open source uh, equivalent to them. Um, has a lot of strengths. Uh, the biggest ones I would say are the data compatibility. You can pretty much get any type of data, throw it into QGIS and it will read it uh, without too much you know, pre-mangling of the data or having to convert it in other programs. Uh, cartography and visualization are one of its real strong points. It's got a lot of tools in there for making maps that look nice um, and, and just you know, really pulling out the power of the data. Uh, the extensibility of QGIS is another one of its big, its big uh, plus points um, in that it's got a, a really extensive Python API. So a lot of, there's hundreds of plugins that you can get and you can just install and they basically extend QGIS in all these ways that people never really planned or thought possible initially. Um, I might be a little bit biased here, but I think it's got a quite nice user interface. Like it's, it's fast to use and it's been, the user interface has basically been developed by GIS users and refined over time. So it has been designed basically by those users to meet their needs. And so as a, as a occasional GIS user myself, it, it's nice to sit down there and have an interface that, that works the way you know, uh, an end user would like. Uh, finally, it's got quite a, strength, a strong uh, set of analytical and scripting tools. Um, and it also allows you to call out to a whole bunch of other libraries and take advantage of their analytical and scripting tool power. Really quickly in numbers, so um, <coughs> QGIS has been around for about 16 years. Um, it's an organic sort of ground up project in that there's no governing company that's driving it. So some open source projects are kind of like a, there's one company behind them and they release the code, um, but they're kind of the, the, the contributors, they're the sole community is that company. QGIS was much more of a ground up effort, so it was a whole bunch of random people really brought together and over time they've, they've kind of uh, collaboratively, collaboratively driven the project and built the project up. Currently about a million lines of code, uh, probably about 80% C++, 20% Python sitting on top of that. Um, and it's, this is a little graph of the contributions basically. So over time, I my mouse over, over time the, it's, on a, it's on an increase. So the, the community is quite healthy. It's growing. There's a lot of interest there. There's a lot of um, companies whose basically whole livelihood is around QGIS support and um, QGIS deployments and extending QGIS. Uh, in terms of geographically, there's contributors basically to QGIS from all over the world. Quite a concentration up in Europe um, with you know, scattering down here in Oceania, which we're hoping is going to grow. But predominantly Europe at the moment. Today I'm going to give a couple of live demos of just little, little tricks and, and sort of features about data analysis that I like to, to demonstrate in QGIS. Um, fortunately, it's a live demo, so it's pretty much guaranteed that if QGIS is going to crash, it's going to crash today. <laughs> <laughs> and the other complicating factor is that, sorry, QGIS 3.4 Point one, it was a bit of a dud release, <laughs> especially on Windows, it randomly crashes. So you know, let's just ignore that. 3.4.2 comes out this Friday, and that's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the one. But uh, I, I think someone has basically saw that the Phosphor G was here, and they wanted to make Nathan's workshop on, on Tuesday a bit difficult, and they wanted to make my talk today a bit difficult, and you know, maybe <laughs> like a little gremlin in there or something. Um, so uh, anyway, I'm going to switch across now to the live part of my talk. You can see that all right? You can see the, the text notes big enough. Um, I, I'll start with just loading up one of my favourite data sets that I like to play with. This is a, if you're from Melbourne, which you know, maybe most of you are, uh, you, you'll kind of recognise this straight away. It's a map of the, the Melbourne train station network. Um, I used to work for Victoria Police down here and, and we used to play with a lot of this sort of data. And for some reason, uh, this, this was one of our data sets we had to work with. It was a, a data set with patronage, basically, the, the amount of people who are using those train stations on a daily basis. Um, and since then, that's just become my favourite data set. I love playing with this one. It was just a way of, of messing with data. Um, it's got kind of cool attributes that you can see here, where 
you have uh, for each station the number of passengers per day and then the percentage breakdown of, of work and education use and, and such. Um, it, it's a good one to kind of explore, explore data, data analysis. I don't really know what the level of everyone here is. I, I suspect we've got a, a pretty wide divide actually between people who are ultra techie and um, you know, ultra data science experts and then we've also got, uh, I imagine, like a whole um, community of people here who are end users, who are new to the community, maybe have never touched this software before. So I'm going to try and ramp this up a bit, so kind of hopefully cover a bit for both. The very first thing I want to show you in QGIS for, for data analysis is what's called the stats doc, and you get to that one by clicking this little stat summary button at the top here, which brings up a little panel here. Um, Let's me choose my layer, so I'm looking at the stations layer, and if I look at the passengers field in that one, hopefully you can read that, it's given me a, a quick statistical summary of all the data that sits in that passengers field for that table. So we can see there that the mean number of passengers per day in Melbourne train stations is uh, about 3,500, or at least it was when I um, got this data set. Uh, and you've got a whole bunch of stuff there, the mean, the median, all this sort of stuff. Um, right down to things like the, the first quarter aisle, third quarter aisle. This little tool is kind of nice for interactively playing with data because it's got a setting down the bottom here where you can say, I only want to see the stats for selected features. So I can get in there and I can start making a selection of my data and say, hey, only, I'm only interested in that. And then that stats doc basically updates live with only the stats for, for those selected features. So I can kind of get in there and start playing and say, oh, what about these ones? You know, what's the, what's the mean passengers for these ones out here? and it's just updating that live. Another, another kind of nice feature about this doc is it actually lets you, you can calculate the stats based on an attribute that exists in the data, but you can also put an expression in here. So I could actually just say, let's give me my passengers per week, so if I multiply it by seven, um, and it updates straight away and gives you the stats now for, for that expression evaluated across the whole line. It's kind of nice, but I would say, don't use that. <laughs> um, the reason I would say don't use that is because in my opinion, that's a bit of an old school GIS technique, is um, you get in GIS and you start doing this ad hoc data analysis where you, you play with stuff, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're interactively messing with data. Um, it's really hard for somebody to come back in a couple of years time and actually work out what you've done there you might have a, a folder full of shape files where it's you know, station patronage v2, station patronage v2 final, station patronage v2 final rev a. Um, and, and it's just this sort of you know, impenetrable mess for somebody else to come back in um, and, and basically you know, untangle what you've done, if they can at all. I would say like, uh, you know, in the last X number of years, there's a more and more growing trend towards uh, accountability with data and reproducibility with statistics um, and basically making sure that when you're delivering products there's a way for somebody else to come back in and verify that what you've done is accurate and is, uh, you, you know, you're not just providing junk. So unfortunately this little doc is handy but it is too much ad hoc, too much um, of, a, of a throwaway technique. So my suggestion instead is to use what's called processing. So QGIS has got this framework that is, was introduced, I don't know, maybe back version 2.2 or something, I think it was. So it's been around eight years, I guess. Um, called processing. And you get to it by hitting this little cog wheel up here on the toolbar. Where straight out of the box, this is just a default QGIS install, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of analytical tools that are available for you to use on your data. So there's a whole bunch of things here that are more kind of common GIS uh, operations, so things like your buffers and your centroids, all that just, you know, GIS 101 kind of functionality. But then it, it, it goes all the way to these really esoteric techniques that, you know, maybe, maybe you would use once in your life as a, as a spatial data person. But having it there, out of the box, ready to use, can sometimes be a lifesaver. 
instead of actually, oh, no, now I'm going to have to script this up myself. I'm going to have to find some way of doing it and, uh, and dig up that, that technique. So things like uh, a pole of inaccessibility, for instance, um, or being able to, where is this one? Orthogonalize a polygon and basically try and turn a slightly skewed polygon square. Um, it, not the sort of thing you do on a day-by-day -day basis, but when you do need them, it's nice to have them there just ready to go. Uh, the other really cool thing about this process in Toolbox is it adds a bunch of tools from uh, projects outside of QGIS. So straight off, you install QGIS. You also see in your process in Toolbox, you've got tools here from GDAL. So you've got things like uh, the ability to call out to the GDAL fill shade uh, tool or the GDAL color relief tool. You've got grass ones here. So grass is, you know, grass is a huge GIS on its own. Multiple decades of, of work has been put into that one. Um, you can call all those ones. So these tools are basically designed to let you start putting together workflows that are reproducible. And that then you can come back three years' time and you'll know, hang on a sec, this is actually the process I did. Yeah, it's still valid. Or, whoops, uh, made a mistake there. Let's hope nobody knows this. Um, so if I was going to calculate stats in QGIS, I would actually use this toolbox and I'd search over here for statistics. Um, and there's one here for a start, basic stats for fields. So this does almost exactly the same thing as that the little dock panel does. Not quite as interactive, but I can run it on the, set, the stations field. Uh, sorry, my passengers field in the stations. I run that. This one actually throws out a HTML report, giving me all those fields. Um, so at the very least, I could save that HTML file somewhere inside my project and there is some way of getting those stats back in, in five years' time. Uh, another nice one here is this stats by categories that I tend to use a lot. And this actually lets you do like a... Um, so I, I can run it over my stations layer, calculating the passengers where I want to break it down by zone. If I run this one now, it will give me a new layer. Um, and I can see, that's a better way of showing this. Uh, so zone one, there's my, you know, the mean passengers per day for zone one stations versus zone two is, is about half. Um, so that, that is a, a better way to get those stats uh, because at least this way, if I run it, I've got the option here to save those, those outputs out somewhere that I can put aside my project and I can uh, make sure that I can retrieve in, in the next number of years' time. I would still say, don't do that. <laughs> that that's still kind of a, an old school GIS technique where you'll end up with a bunch of shape files or a bunch of HTML files in your, you know, in your project folder um, and no way to kind of trace back how they were actually made. My, my advice would actually be to use in this toolbox uh, a graphical model. So even if I was doing something with just a little simple operation, like calculating the stats for a layer, I'd do it in this processing modeler, um, and I'd just put in my stats, my stats algorithm here, um, and hard code a bunch of this stuff. So say, I want to calculate the stats on my stations layer, um, calculating it based on the, the passengers field, and I'm going to save this out to my just got to give it a name to the port output. Um, and I want to put this file somewhere in my project. Uh, put in my temp file here, uh, my output. Um, so now I've got like a, a little kind of graphical model that just does that step. Somebody could come along, look at that model, and they'd see exactly all the processes that I went through to get to that outcome. Um, when I've done that, if it's for a little modular thing like this, you can actually, in newer QGIS versions, it's got an option here to save those models inside a project. So you save it inside that project because that model is specific to that kind of, that set of data that you're working with, that, that workflow, um, you know, that operation. So then when you come back and you pull it back later, you've got, you've got a whole list of your models. I'll just give it a name here, say test model. <coughs> so if I save that inside my project, and I reload this project in four years' time, I'll have a whole bunch of my of little models there that are all the steps I've done to, to get to that data thing, to that, to that output. And I can look back and I can make sure that it's still valid and I didn't make a mistake. Someone else could come back as well and see the process that I went through. That's the way I would recommend. Um, 
when when I when I got into QGIS, you know, my background is kind of like uh, I'd I'd love to call myself a cartographer. I don't know if I can, but I love pretty maps. So so one of my favourite things to do is to make maps that you know I hope look nice and play with the visual side of things. And like I said, I think. I think QGIS has got quite a good strength in terms of how you, it lets you uh, style maps and make them look pretty. One way I'd like to just show before I run out of time today of how we can start making a, a nice data visualization with this layer. Um, let's put this back to just a standard kind of, kind of dot. Um, right. In, inside, inside QGIS, this is one of QGIS's most hidden but most powerful features that a lot of people will use QGIS for, mo for many, many years and they'll never even realise uh, that, it's, that it's sitting there and it's actually right in front of their face the whole time. Um, and that is these little buttons that sit next to all these kind of symbol settings. So these little drop-down menus, they're, they're basically everywhere. You start seeing them all throughout the QGIS interface. So you've got them in, in symbols, we've got them in, I'll put on labels for this layer, they're sitting in next to all the label settings all the way down to you know, the buffer settings for labels, shadow settings for labels. They've all got this little button that's a bit of a mystery sitting next to it. Um, that button is actually, let me turn those labels off. That button actually unlocks what's called uh, data defined settings in QGIS. And what this means is that I can set my, uh, my symbol size to take its value from feature as it's being rendered. So as QGIS is going through and drawing all those dots for the stations, it'll say the size of this station has to be taken from this field in the data, or this expression in the data, and I'll calculate the expression on the fly. The best way to do this is if you click on that little button, there's an option here down the bottom for assistant, which basically does a lot of the, the, the heavy lifting for you. So I can click on there and I say, I want to size my symbols using the passengers field. I'll just click this button to let it fill in the stats. Um, so QGIS here has worked out that the, the minimum value in that table is 199, the maximum is 92,000, probably for Flinders industry. Um, and it's now sizing those symbols between 1 to 10 millimetres based on the value in that, in that field for each station. So instead of being all rendered at the same size, now we've got a bunch of dots of so varying sizes depending on the passenger field. Um, it, it gives you options here as well. You can change how that scaling works. So at the moment, it's like a linear scale. So the bottom value matches the bottom size, top value matches the top size. Um, you can get in there and you can change it. So you can say, I want one that's more of a, a radius-based one or uh, an exponential. And you can see as I do that, these, the, the scaling for the middle values is changing. And I can start playing in here if I can get something a bit nice where I can see, hang on a sec, some of my most used stations are bigger now. That's kind of cool. I like to take it even further and do what's called like a bivariate mapping, where you're, where you're doing the size of the symbol based on one of the attributes and the color based on a different one. And we can use that exact same technique. So in my here, I'll put my fill color using this little data defined setting over here with the assistant. And let's say I want to do this one using the, we'll do this education percent. So this is the percentage of people using that station for educa educational purposes. Um, and now it's mapping those, those values. So a, a zero value in that column maps to a white on this color ramp and a 50% would be a dark blue. Um, and now I've got a really nice bivariate map that we can start looking at where the bigger dots are, are more passengers, they're the more important stations. But here, the darker dots are the ones where there's more use for education. Um, and as we kind of look at this, we can see, hey, there's one down here that's quite large, uh, quite dark. There's, there's a few up here where they're quite dark but very small, so they're you know, not so important. Um, and it lets us see those two factors at once. If you really wanted to, you could do an invariant map where you go through and you say, I also want my, my symbol rotation to be based on this attribute, or I want my symbol outline style to be based on this attribute. And you could start potentially having as many attributes as you want shown in that, in that map as you can you could be readable, basically. Um, so that's a, that's a technique. That's, that's kind of hidden. These buttons, most people don't even know that they're there. You kind of look over them <coughs> when you're looking at the interface. But when you start playing with them, they're everywhere, and they, they unlock a lot of QGIS' symbology power. Um, so I'd encourage, play with those. It's fun. If, if you really want to see what is possible in QGIS 
symbology and cartography, this is the book I would recommend getting. Um, QGIS Map Design, second edition has just come out. Don't get it if you're new to QGIS, get it if you've played around with the interface and you know your way around. You know how to load layers and that sort of stuff. It doesn't start at that spot, it starts at the bit where you already know that and you want to start pushing it further and, and basically unlock all that power of, of the symbology. Thank you. I'm Niall Dawson. Um, I'll, I'll be around. Please come and talk to me. I love talking about QGIS. I love like sharing tips. If you've got issues, if you've got you know pain points, come and talk to me too because I, I like to hear about those as well. Thanks. <laughs>